This video was brought to you by GeneralPack.com, making power systems intuitive, open, and free to everyone, everywhere. Consider subscribing and supporting through Patreon.com slash GeneralPack. This is the mechanism for you to support us financially so we can continue making high quality power system video tutorials. Our corporate sponsor for this topic is Illumiax.com from Seattle, Washington. Contact them for industrial and commercial power system studies. Fault analysis using waveforms. This is part two of the series and we'll continue the series by analyzing this particular article. Uh, this is by Schweitzer Engineering Lab and the author is David Costello and there's a uh, part one and part two of this particular paper which is uh, publicly available. Part one is a problem statement, uh, part two is the answer key. So we'll be using both of these articles together. So in Part one, we actually went through and analyzed this particular waveform in much more detail and you know, answered all of these questions and kind of related to our previous tutorials. Now in part two, we'll actually analyze this waveform right here and answer these questions. So the setup is somewhat like this. It says, uh, another event uh, report from a different system is provided for comparison. Open the event report titled, uh, this is the actual raw files to analyze that case. See figure two for the screen capture for this event. The relay provided was the SEL351A relay, which is a feeder relay. The instruction manual is provided as part of the class material, which is available on the SEL website. So this is the waveform and we'll be analyzing this waveform in a little bit more detail. So just let's just uh, get right to it. So let's briefly look over this uh, waveform. What we have is a uh, line currents uh, shown on the top. So phase A, B, and C, or line A, B, and C current quantities. And then we have voltage quantities that are shown below there. And then we have sequence component quantities below that one. And then we have our digital signals. So as you can see in this region here, what we have is a very uh, uh, normal power system. It's a typical power system where the voltages are really good, meaning that there are uh, reference voltage quantities and the currents seem to be load currents uh, in which we have the 79RS is picked up in the 52A contact is um, asserted, which means that it is closed. So the breaker is closed and everything is in good condition. And then suddenly at this particular point here, and which is really marked by this red dash line, we have a disturbance. And what it seems like is that this line current here, which is indicated by the green, there's a higher presence of this line current, which represents uh, line A current quantities, right? So it seems to be a line A to ground fault. And then we can see the same type of uh, characteristic on the voltage waveform in which this particular voltage waveform is depressed, right? And that voltage represents a phase A voltage in KV. So everything kind of matches up for a line to ground fault. Now, if we look at that in terms of sequence components, we see a rise of uh, sequence component quantities, both positive, negative, and zero sequence components, and they equally rise together, which is also another characteristic of a line to ground fault. So very easily discern right here in this particular part, there is a line to ground fault uh, present here. And the fault current quantities are quite a bit. It's close to about 2,000 amps of uh, fault current. And on the digital waveforms, we see that the 51G element actually picks up at about this point right here. And then it's followed by the 51P element that picks up. So that's just telling us, uh, that's just indication that the ground and the phase uh, current quantities are above a certain threshold. And, they, and it appears to be that way. So what happens after this particular point? And what we see is that there is a presence of both line A current as well as this blue. And this blue represents line B current. So both a line A and line B current uh, is present. And they seem to be equal in terms of uh, current quantity. So it seems, seems to be around the 2000 amp current. And then the remaining phase, which is line C current seems to be pretty much intact. And clear distinction for a line-to-line -line fault would be that both of the lines would 
be equal in magnitude but 180 degrees out of phase and we don't see that here right so the line currents are not 180 degrees out of phase and so this is not a line to line fault it appears to be a line to line to ground fault and we have a voltage depression of these two voltage quantities it's the green and the yellow I mean the purple and the yellow and that is phase A and B voltages and the green and the blue represents the current phase A current and phase B current so seems to be a two line to ground fault here and then later on around the 20 cycle or the 19 cycle mark uh, it becomes a full on three phase fault whereas uh, A, B and C uh, line currents are high and we get a depression of line A, B and C voltages and from a sequence components perspective when it was a two line to ground fault we can see a presence of positive, negative and zero sequence current quantities but as soon as it becomes a three phase fault which is relatively balanced we see a drop off of negative and zero sequence current while the positive sequence current continues to shoot up and so it develops into a full on three phase fault now let's analyze the question that seems to be uh, that seems to be asked the question is on a radio distribution feeder what type of fault do you expect to produce uh, the largest phase current fault current so what type of fault would we have to produce the largest phase current uh, quantities so that really depends on a lot of different factors it boils down to the impedances what is our positive negative and zero sequence impedances right that'll really drive uh, the type of fault and really drive the amount of fault current and the general rule of thumb is the higher the impedance the lower the fault current because it follows um, Ohm's law voltage or current equals voltage over resistance the higher the resistance the lower the current so this right here would be it depends right let's look at the second question does the type of transformer used as a source matter and the answer is yes it does matter because again it goes back to our previous answer depending on the type of transformer that we have will have different impedance quantities and depending on the transformer connection will have different impedance quantities so yes it does matter for sure um, does the fault current uh, location make a difference and this goes back again to the same answer fault current quantities is a function of impedance and when we have a fault that's further away on the line the more the impedance therefore the smaller the fault current can you provide an explanation for the fault type current magnitudes in these two event reports so this question right here is actually uh, very in-depth and it's hard to answer as is so why don't we review the answer key and see what it says so now we're on the answer key and we'll go down to those particular answers and so let's review those answers uh, the first question was on a radio distribution feeder what type of fault current do you expect to produce the largest phase current type and again it, this depends on the fault location and the transformer type so this is I totally agree with that answer uh, does the type of transformer used as a source matter yes core type transformers have lower zero sequence impedance which can make the phase current for a close in line to ground fault larger than that of a three phase fault current so again it goes back to the impedance right the uh, different type of transformer will result in different types of impedances therefore we can get more fault current for a line to ground fault versus other uh, three phase fault types does the fault location make a difference and the author answered yes as the fault moves on a lot uh, moves out on the line for a one line of ground fault the zero sequence impedance which is typically larger than the line positive uh, sequence impedance begins to dominate and make the line of ground fault current less than that of a three phase fault and can you provide an explanation of the fault type current magnitudes in these two event reports see the following derivation so we're going to see the following derivation and uh, review that in a bit more detail so this is the fun part so again uh, what we have here is we're provided a system where we have a source which is connected to a delta y grounded transformer and this we could even assume it to be a DY1 or a delta AB transformer type 
in a Y grounded transformer type, a connection type, and it's connected to a bus, which is then connected to a feeder breaker, which is then connected to a line that goes out to a load. So in here we, ha we have a fault on the bus, which is the one indication, and then the second fault is more towards the end of the line here. For a three phase fault at the bus one, assume infinite source. So we get this as our, our sequence and network diagram. And this is again for a three perfectly balanced three phase fault, we would only see a positive sequence diagram. And that's what we see here, where we have a voltage source, we have the impedance, and in this case, it's on the transformer. Therefore, we only have the transformer impedance, which is ZT1. And I bet you the source impedance is not shown, probably because you're assuming, again, it's an infinite source. So they're not showing the uh, source impedance. But that doesn't matter. I mean, what we have is the transformer impedance. And you can see that the positive sequence current is basically 1, which is your 1 per unit prefault voltage, divided by your ZT1, which is the transformer impedance. And uh, using the legacy equations of symmetrical components, we get line A current is equal to our positive sequence uh, phase A currents. So that is for three phase faults. Now compare that to a line to ground fault at bus one, assume infinite source, we have the positive sequence component here connected to the, the negative sequence connect component and then we have the zero sequence component below. Remember this is open because we have a delta transformer connection on the high voltage side and this is shorted because we have a Y grounded connection on the low voltage side. So this right here is the positive sequence current on the transformer, the negative sequence current and the zero sequence current. This right here is if we have a fault impedance in our one line to ground fault type. And the positive sequence current is flowing through this impedance here. Negative sequence current would flow through this impedance. And then zero sequence current would flow through this impedance. Because positive, negative, and zero sequence currents are connected in series, we would assume that positive, negative, and zero sequence current are equivalent, meaning they equal each other. Right? So if we wanted to calculate positive sequence current, all we would need to do is consider this a typical circuits problem where it's the voltage divided by the sum of the impedances. Here's a voltage, one per unit at the angle of zero degrees. Some of the impedances are positive, negative, zero sequence current plus your fault impedance. And in here, what they're assuming is that the zero sequence transformer impedance, which is this guy right here, is equal to the positive sequence transformer impedance, which is this guy right here. And 3RF is zero, meaning that there is no um, fault impedance, which is fine. So this simplifies down to that the positive sequence current is equal to 1 over 3 times ZT1, which is equal to, again, negative sequence and zero sequence current, because positive, negative, and zero sequence current are the same current. And so what we get is simply that the line A current is equal to the sum of the positive negative zero sequence currents, and that is equal to one over the transformer uh, impedance uh, in, in the most simplest terms, right? So what they're saying is that if the transformer is a core type transformer, because of its lower excitation impedance, the zero sequence impedance can be 85 to 100 percent of its positive sequence impedance, meaning this impedance right here. So what they're saying is that if this impedance is lower than the positive sequence impedance, then if we consider that in our equations, what we get is that the positive sequence current is equal to 1 over 2.85, right? If the zero sequence impedance is 0.85, meaning 85% of the positive sequence current, we consider that into our equation, we get 1 over 2.85 times ZT1. And if we consider line A current, line A current would equal then approximately 3 over 2.85 times ZT1, right? And the 3 is there because we're considering positive, negative, and zero sequence current. And this 2.85 is there because we're considering the impedances, uh, we're adding up the impedances, but zero sequence current is 0.85 of ZT1. So we got positive sequence impedance, which is one, negative sequence impedance, which is an one more, and then we got 0.85 of zero sequence impedance, so that's 2.85, and that simplifies to 1.05 divided by ZT1.
1.05 is basically 3 divided by 2.85. So 1.05 divided by ZT1. So what they're saying here is that the phase A current, which is this current right here, for a line to ground fault is larger than the phase A current for a three phase fault with a certain transformer. So they're saying that you know this value here, which is 1.05 over ZT1 for phase A fault is greater than this value here, which is 1 over ZT1, or simply positive sequence current. So, so what they're, all they're saying is that because this zero sequence impedance is lower, we're going to get slightly higher fault current for a line to ground fault type uh, for the transformer type connection. Now, let's place the same fault on line, on the line. So what happens when you have a three phase fault on line two? and this is where the fault occurs. So now we have the transformer impedance and the line impedance to be considered. And remember what we said before, the greater the impedance, the lower the fault current magnitudes. Let's see if that works. So here's our sequence component diagram for positive sequence current because we're evaluating a perfectly balanced three-phase fault. So our positive sequence current is equal to the pre-fault voltage, one angle zero degrees in per unit, divided by the transformer positive sequence transformer impedance plus the positive sequence line impedance. And for phase A current or line A current, that equals the positive sequence current. So immediately we see that there's a assertion of line current and that reduces your three phase fault uh, current quantities. Now for a ground fault current, the line current is introduced in the positive sequence component, the negative sequence component, and zero sequence component. And we're assuming that the zero sequence transformer impedance is equal to the positive and negative sequence transformer impedance. So it makes you know this calculation simpler. So this value, this value, and this value are equivalent. And then we're saying that the line impedance, zero sequence line impedance, is equal to three times the positive sequence line impedance. Meaning this line impedance right here is three times the positive sequence line impedance, which is a good judgment to make, um, right, because of, you know, symmetric components. And then your positive sequence line current is equal to negative sequence line current. So positive sequence line current and negative sequence line current are equivalent. And 3RF is equal to zero, meaning we don't have any fault impedance. Now when we rearrange this equation, what we end up getting is that your positive sequence current, which is the same as your negative sequence current and your zero sequence current, that is equal to pre-fault voltage, one per unit at the angle zero degrees, divided by three times positive sequence transformer impedance plus positive sequence impedance, and then you add up two times your positive sequence line impedance. So basically, you know, you're just counting up these impedances together. And your line A current is simply equals to three times your positive sequence current. So what ends up happening is that your IA simply becomes one per unit at the angle of zero degrees, so your pre-fault voltage, divided by your transformer impedance, positive sequence, your line impedance, positive sequence, plus two-third of your line impedance, positive sequence, right? And so what we're saying here is that these two values are gonna be the driving factor, right? Your positive sequence line current and two thirds of the positive sequence line current is gonna be much greater than your transformer impedance and therefore your phase A current quantities is gonna be quite a bit lower. So mathematically it makes sense, the further you are in the line, the lower the fault current. And that's what they say here. Line A current for a line to ground smaller than, uh, uh, for a line to ground smaller than IA for a three phase fault for two. For two meaning it's a line fault current and your line to ground fault current quantities are smaller than your three phase fault current quantities. And that's all dependent, we've introduced the, the sequence component quantities. And then uh, that is about it as far as this particular derivation goes. I hope this video was useful and enlightening for students and professionals. Please continue to support us and donate at, at patreon.com slash generalpack. Thank you.